and of Maharaj. So, Mataji, please take over the call, Mataji. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna devotees. His Holiness Chandramali Swami Maharaj is a disciple of ISKCON founder, founder Acharya, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, and he is an initiating spiritual master within the ISKCON movement. Maharaj was born in New Jersey in 1947, and he came in contact with the International Society for Krishna Consciousness in Denver, Colorado at the age of 24. In 1973, he began practicing Krishna consciousness in New York City, and shortly thereafter began serving at the New Vrindavan Farm Community in West Virginia. West Virginia. That same year, he received initiation from Srila Prabhupada, and in 1986, His Holiness Chandramali Swami Maharaj accepted the sannyas order and began preaching in Cincinnati and Columbus, Ohio. In 1995, he began serving as a resident sannyasi in Chicago, where he was based until 2013, when he relocated to Karlovac, Croatia. At present, Maharaj offers spiritual guidance around Europe, the USA, and in India. So I now hand over the call to you, Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Shri. Thank you. My obeisances to you and to all the devotees. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Omigyan to Mirandasya, Ginajana Samakaya, Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tas, my Shri Guruvena Maha, Shri Chaitanya Manobistam, Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padati Kam, Uma Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale, Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamay Namaste Sarasati Deve, Gorvani Pacharine Nirvashe Sasun Yavadi Pastyatya De Sitarine Anchakalpa Turubhishya Kubrasindu Vaivacha Patitanam Pavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Maho Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasadi Gaur Bhaktivinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare Hare. So we can begin. We will need to see the verse placed upon the uh, share screen. Okay. okay this is uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, verse 1 from Canto 4, chapter 31, and this chapter is, uh, you know, see, the creation of the fourth order, and it's the, I believe it's the last chapter, it is, in Srimad Bhagavatam, fourth canto. Uh, Maitreya Uvacha Tata Upana Vigyana Asvahok Saja Basitam Smanrata Atmaje Bariam Bistrija Pravrajan Grihat. Translation is the great Saint Maitreya. After that, the Purchetas lived at home for thousands of years and developed perfect knowledge and spiritual consciousness. At that time, they remembered the blessings of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and left home, putting their wife in charge of. A perfect son. Srila Prabhupada's purport. After the Prajatas had finished their penance, they were blessed by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Lord blessed them by telling them that after leaving their family life, they would return home back to Godhead in due course of time. After finishing their family life, which lasted thousands of years according to the calculation of the demigods, the Prachetas decided to leave home, putting their wife in charge of their son named Daksha. This is the process of Vedic civilization. In the beginning of life as a brahmachari, one has to undergo severe penances and austerities in order to be educated in spiritual life. The brahmachari or student is never allowed to mingle with women and learn from the very beginning of life about sex enjoyment. 
The basic flaw in modern civilization is that boys and girls are given freedom during school and college to enjoy a sex life. Most of the children are varna sankara, meaning born of undesirable fathers and mothers. Consequently, the whole world is in chaos. Actually, human civilization should be based on Vedic principles. This means that in the beginning of life, boys and girls should undergo penances and austerities. When they are grown, they should get married, live for some time at home and beget children. When the children are grown up, the man should leave home and search for Krishna consciousness. In this way, one can make one's life perfect by going home to the kingdom of God. Unless one practices penances and austerities in his student life, he cannot understand the existence of God. Without realizing Krishna, one cannot make his life perfect. The conclusion is that when the children are grown, the wife should be put in the children's charge. The husband may then leave home to develop Krishna consciousness. Everything depends on the development of mature knowledge. King Prachini Barhishat, the father of the Prajetas, left home before the arrival of his sons, who were engaged in austerities within the water. As soon as the time is ripe, or as soon as one has developed perfect Krishna consciousness, he should leave home even though all his duties may not be fulfilled. Prachina Barhishad was waiting for the arrival of his sons, but following the instructions of Narada, as soon as his intelligence was properly developed, he simply left instructions for his ministers to impart to his sons. Thus, without waiting for their arrival, he left home. Giving up a comfortable life is absolutely necessary for human beings. It is advised by Prahlad Maharaj, Hidvatvatam Griham Andakupam. To finish the materialistic way of life, one should leave his so-called comfortable home, which is simply a means for killing the soul, atvapatam. The home is considered to be a dark well covered by grass. If one falls within this well, he simply dies without anyone's caring. One should therefore not be too much attached to family life or it will spoil one's development in Krishna consciousness. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Oh, you can keep the verse up on the board. That would be the best. Okay. Yeah, bring it. Yeah. So, oh, this verse kind of heralds the uh, principle of the organized principle, the organized arrangement of uh, society. In today's society, uh, there is no real designated organization. Therefore, people plan things according to what they think will work or what has already been traditionally practiced by their families and friends. In other words, um, there's no clear understanding of how to live life, nor is there understanding of what is the actual goal of life. The goal of life is Adato Brahma Jigyasa, which means to inquire into the nature of the absolute truth. So what is my relationship with the Supreme Lord? How to uh, fulfill my duties in relationship to the Supreme Lord and how to get the benefit of those activities by developing love for the Lord and eventually returning back to the spiritual world. Therefore, with that goal in mind, the social organization has to be supportive of the ultimate goal of life, which is Prema Pumartha Mahan, to develop love for Krishna. Love for God is the goal of life because love is the natural condition of the living entity's existence. Vityasiddha, Krishna Prema, Sadhu Kabunai Sravanari Siddhi Chitte Koriye Udoi. In the hearts of all living beings, that means within the soul itself, natural love exists for the Supreme Lord. And the awakening of that love is actually the principle of success in life. Therefore, one's material activities have to be molded in such a way as to support the goal and not take away from the goal. 
So we have what is called the Van Ashram system. The Van Ashram system is the basic organization of society. There are what is called the priests or the leaders of the society who give spiritual direction to the rest of society. There are the managers, the organizers. Uh, we might say to the persons who are in charge of social political developments and manage those things. Uh, then you have the persons who are required to provide the, uh, they call the bread basket of society. In other words, providing food for the society, the Vaishnavas, along with protecting animals and uh, teaching how to live according to the principles of proper financial arrangements or suitable arrangements that are, that are uh, conducive to one's development in family life. And the last of the sudras, or we might say the assistants, the workers who support the rest of the three varnas by performing activities and support. So this is, this is called varna. And then you have ashram, you have the brahmacharis, you have the grihastas, you have the sannyasis, you have the vanaprastas. So vana and ashram is a system, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, chatur varna mayasrista guna karma vibhaga saha. This is the basic principle for a healthy society. Of course, nowadays, there's no vana ashram. And even if you try to establish an ashram, you wouldn't know where to start <laughs> because the society has no clear understanding of of activities, importance of duties in relationship to each other and to uh, the Supreme. And therefore, the basic principle now is education, educating people in such a way that they can practice um, their natural, what we say, propensities, and at the same time, practice the goal of life within the context of one of the designated ashrams, such as Brahmachari, Grihasta, Vanaprast, and Sannyas. Here we talk, we're talking about what is Grihasta life. And we see most of society, and even within the Iskand society, most people are Grihastas. They live within the family. The majority are like that. When Prabhupada first started the movement, it wasn't like that. Everyone was temple-based, and the society was, if someone was living outside of the temple, it was very rare. Most of those who were practicing Krishna consciousness were living in the temples, and the temples were quite full in those days, anywhere from 100 to 150 to 200 devotees in most of the major temples around the world. But as society, as the infrastructure started to develop within the temples and society and develop devotees started to see the need to designate ashrams, the Grihastha ashram became more and more proficient or more prolific. And people started to get married and build families based around that. So here we see what is, what is family life to live yeah, uh, Prabhupada says to live outside of the temple and not be married is not grihasta life. Grihasta life means to live with a wife in a home, and that is grihasta life. Mm -hmm. And living in a home doesn't make one grihasta, there has to be family life there. And there's two kinds of family life. There is the materialistic family life, which is called griha mating. Griha mating means selfish or self-interested. And grihasta means those who are interested in uh, pursuing the goal of life within the context of family life. And so there are rules and regulations. And these rules and regulations are meant to, to bring out the good qualities of the living beings. And sometimes they are called austerities. Austerity simply means 
to perform an activity which gets you off the bodily platform and helps you to approach the spiritual platform. So we have what is called the four regulative principles in our society. No, no intoxication, no gambling, no meat eating, and no illicit sex, or sex only for the procreation of children. So those four are foundational in order to perform devotional service in any of the four ashrams, but particularly in the Grihastha ashram, because in Grihastha ashram to raise children is one of the one of the prime duties of the Grihasthas to bring children into the world and at the same time educate the children both in what is required to live in this world and at the same time the most important the goal of life teaching them how to practice bhakti yoga. Krishna consciousness. So um, if one lives according to the principles of one's ashram, be it Grihastha ashram or Brahmachari ashram or Sannyas ashram, Griya, the uh, Vanaprastha ashram is not so much uh, clarified, although it is existing within the ISKCON society, but that's a whole other discussion on that, but we are mostly interested in making progress spiritually and fulfilling our material needs within the ashram. So with for brahmachari, what is the need? Brahmachari's need is quite simple. They work under the direction of the spiritual master. They carry out the instructions. They live in the temple. They associate with other devotees who are doing the same thing. Life is quite simple. They chant, they dance, they perform services, they study scriptures, they take prasadam, and they do various duties in relationship to the spiritual master's guidance and the mission of Krishna consciousness. For the Grihastas, they have other responsibilities along with the spiritual activities, and that is to maintain family. So maintaining family is not a lifelong affair, as it's described here in this particular verse. You can bring up the purport, but it would be good to see some of the statements Prabhupada makes here. He said, one should not stay in the family to the end of life. He says, when one actually has developed full Krishna consciousness, then one can retire from that ashram. And then for the man, he can take sannyas, and for the lady, she can also go to live in holy places and work or serve under the direction of the uh, priests in the holy places who engage in devotional service for serving the local deity in holy places like that. That's a form of vanaprastra, actually. And so, um, the ideal human life is meant for self-realization. So family life is a part of life and it's not the end of all of life. We see now in materialistic society, people die in the family and therefore they're guaranteed to take birth again because their attachment to family members and family activities and other things related to the family stays within their mind and consciousness through the end of life. And therefore, at the time of death, they cannot free themselves from these desires, which are meant to be gradually reduced through the process of detaching oneself in, in family responsibilities. So the general formula is that as the children grow up and become responsible and take charge of their own lives, the parents move more directly into practicing full Krishna conscious activities. That's the actual formula. But we see here, there's also concession. And what is we see here in the concession is that the, uh, that the uh, father of the Prachetas, uh, King Prachini Barhishat, on the instructions of Narada Muni, he decided to leave home even before his children returned to take over the responsibility of the kingdom. 
he had already achieved full Krishna consciousness and without waiting for their arrival, he left home. So this is also, this is acceptable that the idea is to focus at the end of life is the most important time of life where one should focus fully on the activities of devotion. We see in the life of many great persons, they retire from family life and they go on to perform devotional service like them. Many of the great kings in the past have uh, lived their life as leaders and at one point decided to remove themselves, even Lord Ramachandra, who was the Supreme Personality of Godhead, retired from his kingdom at one time, left everything in the charge of his sons. And of course, he disappeared and went back to the spiritual world. But he was teaching by example, he was a very powerful and very successful king. There was no problems within his kingdom and he had ruled perfectly for 35, for 36,000, no, was it 13,000 years, I think. No, I'm sorry. 13,000 years were the last 13,000 years he performed austerities once his wife Sita Devi had left and gone to Valmiki's ashram and also returned back to the spiritual world. Before then, he also ruled for many thousands of years. So um, success in life is not to accumulate uh, material things or material uh, arrangements. Success in life is, is prema pumartha maham to develop love of God. And so by following the Vedic culture, which is a superior culture in order to practice uh, Krishna consciousness, one has to go through life step by step, going through the different stages, moving to the next stage, and finally, the ultimate principle is to renounce everything, focus on Krishna, focus on the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and go back home, back to Godhead. Uh, it can be done. It doesn't sound so far-fetched. Some people think, well, it's not practical in Western society because we have so much responsibility. But we see that even now, devotees in the ISKCON movement at a certain stage uh, leave their hearth and home and go and perform, either take sannyas or go to holy places or go out traveling. And pre in other words, the family responsibilities have no longer any importance. And this is progress in material. This is progress in life. So we are now embarking on the new year. This is the beginning of the Jejo Christian year. I'm not sure what year it is in the Jejo Christian calendar. I guess it's considered to be 2021. And uh, we also understand that one of the principles for New Year's is to make some kind of vow, resolution. <sighs> The word resolution comes up as a means for making better the upcoming year than what was there before. There is like a junction where one decides to uh, resolve. The word resolution comes from the word resolve. Resolve means to, uh, to, to solve a problem or to move forward to better one's life. In Krishna consciousness, sometimes we call that a vow. It's called sankalpa. Sankalpa means a determined vow to achieve something. Uh, resolution may also mean something that I want to get rid of. That is something that uh, is holding me back in life. And then we also have the word affirm. Affirm means uh, I have a desire to achieve something. I know what I want to achieve. I have made my un uh, the understanding and affirm means that I make a strong desire to achieve it and nothing will it stop me. So um, Srila Prabhupada talks about one verse spoken by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary 
on one verse from the Bhagavad Gita 2.41, Vyasatmika Budhir, Ekehat Kudanandana, Pahu Sakya Yanatascha, Budayo Vyavasahinam. Those who are on this path are resolute in purpose and their aim is one. O beloved child of the Kurus, the intelligence of those who are irresolute is many branch. So a strong faith that by Krishna consciousness, one can be elevated to the practice, perfectional practice of life is called Vyavyasatmika. Faith means unflinching trust in something sublime. Krishna consciousness is the process of an activity of sublime. Sublime means it's not tangible in, in physical form, but it exists. It's something. So to make a resolution, this word the resolve purpose of a person is based on knowledge. So uh, this verse, Prabhupada applies it to himself in his practice of spreading Krishna consciousness around the world. And he gave, Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur gives the understanding that whether it's easy or whether it's difficult is not a consideration. So this is a very important part. If you want to achieve something that's, that's worthy to achieve, that's noteworthy, then you have to push aside whether it's easy or difficult. Difficulties should not be means to become discouraged or to give up one's determined vow because difficulties are actually opportunities to bring out one's, what we say, resolute qualities that will provide the success to achieve one's goal. In other words, when we have obstacles in life, it's good because it helps us to, to go to where we can get the strength to overcome obstacles and devotees know where do you get that strength? You get it from Krishna. You get it from chanting the holy names of the Lord. So in our process of Krishna consciousness, we have these junctions in life provided even all by the social environment or by our own determined efforts to move forward in Krishna consciousness. And so this new year gives us a chance to see where am I lacking? What do I want to improve on? What do I want to achieve? Of course, we know what we want to achieve. We want to achieve ultimate happiness because ultimate happiness is the principle which makes life worth living. <laughs> without happiness, there is no value to life. Those who live with life without being happy are not actually living, they're just existing. They're going through the motions. So one should be happy, but one has to know what is happiness and where to find it. And the devotees understand that happiness is in relationship to my nature. So what is my nature? My nature is to serve. My nature is to serve with love because love is the, is the quality by which one is motivated to serve. So that to fulfill that loving propensity means to direct it to its original source. And what is that original source? The Supreme Personality of Godhead, one of his manifested forms is as Krishna, Rama, Nishringa, Lord Chaitanya, like that. So then when one makes the, re the resolution, so we have two things. We have the ultimate goal and we have the intermediate goals. So the intermediate goals are steps towards the ultimate goal. So these opportunities to make resolutions or what we call sankalpas, Again, the word sankalpa means determined vow. Uh, a determined vow is a sankalpa. So in order to achieve the ultimate goal, we need to also set in place intermediate goals which lead to the ultimate goal. And one is one, is one of the intermediate goals 
we may have, there may be many intermediate goals. Some of them are positive and some of them are negative, which means some we need, some things we need to get rid of, which will move us forward. And some things we need to adopt, to take on and which will move us forward. Generally, the positive ones are the one we focus on. The negative ones will generally fall away as the positive develops. For instance, to use an example, if you want to satisfy your hunger, you eat. And not only do you satisfy your hunger, you become happy and you also nourish and get strength in the body. So there's a verse in this 11th canto that says, by performance of devotional service, one gets, uh, one gets knowledge, one gets uh, increased in their relationship for Krishna, and one gets detachment from material, uh, material activities or material desires. These three happen automatically by the process of devotional service. So I would just like to bring one of the, one of the determined vows that we can achieve or look towards, and that is increasing the quality of our chanting. Here is an area where we can actually move forward very fast, not only in that area of quality chanting, but in all areas, because chanting is the foundation for all of our activities in spiritual life. As Srila Prabhupada would say, 95%, 99% of your advancement in spiritual life depends on the quality of your chanting the holy names of the Lord. So Prabhupada writes to one temple president, I think his name was Abhiram, and uh, it's sitting in the Chicago temple on the wall. When I was uh, staying in Chicago temple, I found this statement by Prabhupada to Abhiram and uh, we had it put into a plaque and we placed it on the wall in the Chicago temple. And it says that the temple president must make sure that the devotees are following the process, coming to Mangalarti and chanting 16 good rounds. <laughs> so he uses the word good in the statement. So just to chant is nice, but quality chanting is actually chanting. So here's something that we can think about in terms of increasing our Krishna consciousness in a very direct way. There's other activities we may also perform that are important, but by, by increasing the quality of our chanting with more devotion and with more quantity also, increasing the number uh, as Prabhupada writes, the more you chant, the more you'll free yourself from offensive chanting. So quantity helps to bring about quality. And quality is actually the goal. Quality in anything we do makes life, uh, what we say, wonderful. When we do something that doesn't have quality in it, or we just do it to get it done, it leaves us a little bit uh, less satisfied uh, or we just actually don't understand the importance of what we're doing. But chanting is so direct that it opens up the doors to understanding knowledge. Uh, it helps to build better relationships with others. It helps everything on uh, all levels of our development. So, of course, we can make our sankalpa or our determined vow for this New Year's in different areas. And I should just mention, while we're speaking about this, uh, there is an upcoming uh, Zoom conference coming at 2.30 uh, UK time, which I don't, I think it's about um, 9.30 uh, Eastern Standard Time, if I'm correct. 8.30 Central Standard Time in America, where His Holiness Radhanath Maharaj will be speaking on meditations for the new year. 
So this is uh, going to be a landmark talk on how we can see and envision our life in relationship to how to live in the upcoming year and beyond that, of course. So I just wanted to make that a part of this presentation because I will be watching it myself because uh, we, I'm sure all of us can gain so much insight from Maharaja's talk, which will come up um, at uh, 2.30 UK time um, and 9.30 Eastern Standard Time. So I'll stop here and uh, uh, see if there's any comments or questions in relationship to what we discussed. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you so much Maharaj for uh, such a wonderful class in telling us about how to take a resolution in the new year. And I like the most this point that uh, you should not only chant, but chant good rounds, good number of rounds. So thank you so much Maharaj, it helps a lot during our chanting. So now I will request devotees if they have any questions or they there was want a to... question, there was a, there was a request by Matsya on the chat, the link to Maharaj's uh, Zoom talk I sent yesterday on my conference. So Matsya, you can check with Natasha. I think she has access to the conference and and you'll find the link there that I sent. But it's also uh, available uh, through social medias, I think, also. Yeah. But, yeah. OK, <clears throat> so open it up for questions. Um, Hare Krishna Maharaj, Nandot Pranam, all goes to Srila Prabhupada, all goes to you. Very, very beautiful and instructive class, Maharaj. Uh, I was thinking everybody puts the New Year's resolutions. I will do this, I will do that. But uh, what I see, I don't have time to put extra efforts in like anything. But uh, you solve my problem, like uh, chanting should be linked. I, I don't, I cannot uh, increase number of rounds what I am already taken a vow. And uh, uh, so, Doing a good quality um, chanting is the like is the best resolution for me. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quality. It says that we if we could chant just one name purely, and uh, that frees us from all the uh, sinful reactions for many many lifetimes that are there. So uh, yeah, we want to chant with quality, but we're not happy just to chant one name. We want to chant more and more because one of the features of chanting is that we develop a taste when our chanting develop, starts to become uh, on the level of quality and that taste inspires us, us to chant more automatically. Now Prabhupada made a statement in this regard, he said, when you're chanting Hare Krishna, you'll think 16 rounds? Why not 16,000 rounds? <laughs> <laughs> so, so he was saying that it, it's very sweet and very uh, edifying to chant the holy name. And so uh, one will be inspired to continue as we develop this taste. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Dear Guru Maharaj, Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to Your Holiness. Thank you for this very instructive class again about uh, the various stages that we must go through in order to actually go back home back to godhead it's so easy for us to get especially you know those of us in family life to get caught up in the travails and tribulations of our children their issues their difficulties but 
here it is clearly said that one must retire from active family life and move on to the next stage vanaprastha and then sanyas and so on so i'm remembering somehow by krishna's mercy during the bhakti shastri we had come across this so in the shrimad bhagavatam first canto chapter 15 verse 37 it's about the pandavas retiring timely and there chila prabhupad has clearly said maharaj yudhishthir what i'm just reading out two sentences if i may maharaj yudhishthir wanted to retire just to set an example for others as soon as there is some young fellow to look after the household affairs one should at once retire from family life to uplift oneself to spiritual realization one should not rot in the dark well of household life till one is dragged out by the will of yamaraj <laughs> pretty strong <laughs> statement yeah. right very 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 seriously prabhu pad is saying modern politicians should take lessons from maharaj yudhishthir about voluntary retirement from active life and should make room for the younger generation also retired old gentlemen should take lessons from him and leave home for spiritual realization before being forcefully dragged away to meet death mm-hmm. thank you yeah the idea is that if we're attached at the time of death by family members who are going to crowd around you and cry and you know become more sad than you are you've entered into this wrong consciousness and your attachments will never fall away the idea is to focus completely on the lotus feet of the supreme personality of godhead and uh, make that the final uh, absorption as we leave this material world and by krishna's arrangement he always helps the devotees gradually move to the perfectional stage so yeah um i think i don't think we have that clear in our society yet uh it's nice that my my wife is a devotee my kids are the devotee i'm a devotee but still the we can, that attachment can cause one to take another birth again like that so we see the example from maharaj yudhishthir of lord shri ram chandra and others king prachini barhi shot for the final moment one should detach themselves completely and arrange to absorb oneself in thoughts of the supreme lord Anything else? Any other comments or questions? Mm-hmm. Um, do we have any questions on the chat? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Hare Krishna Maharaj, the Lord. Thank you, Maharaj, for the nice class. So, so Maharaj, uh, my question is like uh, this one today. What we are discussing, right, about giving up family life. Mm. uh mahaprabhu in one of the chapters in madhya leela i'm just reading that maharaj so he he gives this uh, suggestion to that brahmana right go back to your village uh, go back to your family and stay and you know preach right so let me see maharaj i'm trying to find that right yeah in one village there was a vedic brahmana named kurma he invited la chaitanya to his home with the great oh, yeah. respect and due right maharaj so yeah but that karma brahma wasn't he hadn't finished his responsibilities in the family the lord had visited his home for four days when he was traveling through the south and he stopped and stayed with the family karma along with his family served the lord very nicely and got very much attached to the lord and when the lord was leaving 
Korma didn't want to leave the Lord, so he started to follow. And Lord Chaitanya said, no, you can't do that. You have your responsibilities with your family and go back. And then he told him that while you're in your family life, just preach Krishna consciousness. And they say, he said, if you do that, then you'll never leave my association. But he wasn't, the Korma Brahman was not in a position to leave his family life. That was premature on his part. Uh, Lord Chaitanya wanted, Lord Chaitanya was actually teaching a certain principle that Grihe Tako, Bande Tako, Sabda Hari Boli Dako, that wherever you are, if you're in a household life, whatever your ashram is, whatever your situation is, be an instrument for, murder, for spreading the mercy of Krishna consciousness to others. So he was trying to help him understand that there's no impediments to spiritual life if you practice Krishna consciousness properly in the household life. And he told him, you know, he, whoever you meet, tell them about Krishna. Whoever you meet, teach him to chant Hare Krishna. He said, by my, guru, by, by my command, be guru, save the land. Yeah. So in this way, he taught him that uh, uh, to live in household life and be an instrument to preach Krishna consciousness. He didn't have to give up his family. But then, you know, but the basic scheme was in the Van Ashram system is at one time when all the family responsibilities are finished and one can retire from that. And not generally we don't encourage that beforehand. In other words, when the children are grown up and they have their own lives now, they're married. It's the duty of the father to get the daughter married. And that's a, that's a vow that the father has to do. If he doesn't do that, and he hasn't fulfilled his duty as a dutiful parent. And when everything is done in, that, in, that, in these uh, responsibilities, then you can gradually move away and then focus on full devotional service. We have many of the great personalities. Even we have Juva Maharaj, he did that. He left at a certain time. Oh, so many of the great kings mentioned in the Bhagavatam, when they reached a certain level of uh, uh, practice, of spiritual life, they left everything. Of course, even Maharaj Pariksit, he was premature. He left everything. He left his family. He left everything. You know, he left his kingdom. Everything was so nice. There was no even reason, but it was the will of the Supreme Lord that he do that so he could be the instrument to uh, hear Srimad Bhagavatam and take that Bhagavatam and spread it around the world. So, so there are many examples, both what we say in the middle of life, someone leaves, in the end of life, someone leaves, but there's no example that one should stay all the way into the end of the family and die in family life. Okay. Um, so for the Korma Brahman, it wasn't his time to leave. But Lord Chaitanya wanted to make this point, stay there, take care of your family, preach. <laughs> Amara Guru Hoy, what is that verse? You just brought it up on the verse, on the chat there. Instruct everyone to follow the orders of law and they are given in the Bhagavad Gita and this way become a spiritual master and try to liberate the land. Hmm. So in this particular case, See, we found like in, in our society, sometimes the devotees would get married. And then right after the marriage, the, the man after a few years marriage would want to take sannyas and leave his newly married wife. Uh, so Prabhupada 
wasn't so happy with that, but he did grant a few of them sannyas because he saw that if he didn't do it, they were going to leave anyway. So in order to not to allow him to di disobey the spiritual master's instructions he gave, I don't want to mention any names, but there are a few sannyasis who, who left their wife prematurely and came to take sannyas. And in some were successful and some were not successful. So that's another thing. So there's a lot of variables, but the most important thing is what is beneficial to achieve full Krishna consciousness? That is the principle that motivates one in a certain in the in a certain direction. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mara. So the important thing was responsibility, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What is, you. Your, what is your name again? Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. My name is Suresh Shamdas from Charlotte Maharaj. Uh, from Charlotte. Suresh. Yes, okay. Thank yes. you, Maharaj. Uh, yeah. Hare Krishna. Yeah, even uh, I was just opening the purport, Maharaj, for verse. When Prabhupada says it is not advisable in this age of Kali Yuga to leave one's family suddenly, for people are not trained as brahmacharis and grihasthas. So, yeah. 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 Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Koti Koti Denver Pranam, Shila Prabhupada, Shila Guru Dev Ki Jai. Please pray for us that we will chant our round every day, 4.30 to 6.30 complete. And we will follow the instruction of Shila Prabhupada, Shila Guru Dev, Shri Shiraja Parinam. Koti Koti Dhanbhut Pranam to your sincere Seva Maharaj. Please pray for all Bhakti Sangha Mataji. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Hare Krishna. My obeisance is to you. Thank you for your blessings. <laughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, please your respectful obeisances. Thank you so much for a very, very wonderful class. Um, Maharaj, about increasing the quality of chanting, it looks like uh, even if we want to increase the quality, uh, if if uh, Krishna is not pleased or uh, we are committing offenses uh, somewhere, uh, that is like kind of obstruction to increase the quality or quantity. Yeah, we have to avoid offenses. That's why during the initiation ceremony, uh, most of the time, Srila Prabhupada, Jai Jagannath Paladev Subhadra Marani Ki Jai. Srila uh, Prabhupada would always have the 10 offenses recited during the initiation ceremony to remind everyone that Krishna consciousness contains things to do and things to avoid. So the, the offenses are things to avoid. So even if it's difficult, it doesn't make it optional. We have to avoid defenses. There's no question about that. Uh, you can avoid defenses once you know what the offenses are. And then you uh, carefully understand what causes you, what causes one to commit an offense. So then you have to be careful. So Krishna consciousness, as Prabhupada said, is like shaving with a razor. You have to be very attentive to the activities. And that means consciousness. If we're not applying our consciousness in everything we do in the right way, this is called ekagrata. Ekagrata means one-pointed focus in the activities of our devotional life. If we're not keeping that focus, then uh, we can easily commit an offense. <laughs> and the offenses are the things that keep us really locked into the material uh, consciousness because to get rid of material desires are not so hard, but to avoid offenses is a lot harder more difficult. 
And offenses are very, there are many kinds of offenses. So there are offenses to the holy name. There are offenses to the deity. There's offenses to the Vaishnavas. Offenses to people in general. These are the four main categories of offenses. And then there's offenses in uh, execution of bhakti. Uh, this wrong ways to do bhakti. There's also offenses in um, in the Holy Dham. If we're visiting the Holy Dham or living in the Holy Dham, there is rules and principles that we have to follow. Otherwise, we get implicated in offenses. So yeah, this is where we have to be a little bit more attentive. Are very attentive to carefully avoid offenses. So, how one of the what is one of what's one formula that will help you to avoid offenses? And that is Lord Chaitanya's verse, and he speaks from the Shikshastakam, Trinadapi, Sunichena, Tayor Ivasa Hishnuna, Amanina Mamanadena. The, this was what he's saying is, if you practice these four things, you will generally always be in the position to make advancement and you will free yourself from the tendency to commit offenses. You cultivate humility, tolerance, pridelessness, and respect for all other living beings. And that will that's a big factor in avoiding offenses by cultivating this mood of devotion. We can, and of course, Bhakti Vinoda Kaur explains that if you're chanting attentively, the possibility to commit any of the other 10 offenses is reduced considerably. But if, we were, if we're not chanting attentively, then the tendency will be to commit some of the other offenses. So there's our, if we emphasize strongly these positive attentive chanting and developing devotional qualities, and then of course, the verse ends, kirtaniya sadarahi. That means one can, sada means always, one can chant the holy names of the Lord always if one is practicing these principles carefully. So bhakti is a science. It requires application of the principles and the right mood. If we have the application of the principles, but we don't have the right mood, we won't get the full benefit. And if we have the right mood, but we're acting in the wrong way, we also will not get the right mood. <laughs> Right, the full benefit. So, uh, therefore, cultivate these this verse, Chanada Peace and Iche Na. Practice that. As Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami explains in Chaitanya Charitamrita, he says, take this verse, string it on the necklace of the, your holy name, and wear it as your ornament. So he gives a lot of prominence to this as being the ornament of a Vaishnava. So if we can practice that more and more, the tendency is we won't commit offenses. And even if we do, it'll be very small or insignificant. Wonderful, wonderful Maharaj. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, <laughs> very nice step by step you explained. And, you know, we have to hear it again and again. Uh, thank thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be right back to ready to answer the next question. I just have to do one little thing. I have an offering that's on the altar and needs to be taken off and Something else needs to put you put on, and I'll be right back.
Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Guru Mahaya, Cheris Mohanasi Niratha. Please accept my humble obeisances of Loris to Srila Prabhupada. I would like to ask you if this verse uh, from Srimad Bhagavatam, is it a general principle, or general instruction for all devotees, or should we uh, um, act according to our situation? For example, when we have uh, grandkids to stay uh, with uh, the family and take care about uh, the grandkids, or is it uh, to understand like uh, it goes hand in hand anyway? Well, <laughs> we have our, our duty is to become fully Krishna conscious. Uh, you, you can look at it from different angles. Um, it's a general statement and applies generally across the board. But there are some exceptions. But those exceptions can only be uh, understood or uh, practiced by superior guidance and not independently. Um, there are many examples of uh, great souls, of course, who left everything and went out to take sannyas and preach Krishna consciousness. You have, you have the uh, proponent of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Srihar Swami. His life was exemplary like that. He left everything uh, to practice fully spiritual life. And you have, uh, what is his name in uh, Tukaram, also. also. So there are many. Now we might not be like on that level where we're getting a calling to preach Krishna consciousness to the world. But if there is some family consideration, then we have to see how to solve that in relationship to their goal in life. We can't say, well, we can't put our material responsibilities ahead of our spiritual practice because at one point you lose both. <laughs> if you put the spiritual first, you always gain. You might lose the material. So with a woman, it might be very different than with a man, but both have to become Krishna conscious. That's that's for sure. So superior guidance from spiritual masters, or those on the level of one spiritual master is required when certain situations seem to be conflicting. Otherwise, how will you know what to do? Yes, I understand, Guru Maharaj. I feel like uh, if the kids in the first class don't learn from the teacher how to write the letters, then they also don't know what to do. No? <laughs> yeah. Hare, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the same line, I, I know when Mataji asked this question, it reminded me of Bhishma Dev. Is there a reason, and Bhishma Dev is considered a Mahajan, right? Is there a reason why he did not take up to retire life and we see that he was fighting the battle till the end? Um, well, yeah, there was a couple reasons. One, he was being supported by Duryodhana as long as Karna was also in the same position. And uh, I mean, Bhishma was qualified to rule the world. He was a king, but he couldn't take up that position because 
kings have to be, they have to, have, they can't be, they have to be grihastas. <laughs> so he couldn't marry. He took a vow of lifelong brahmachari. But another thing he, he stayed in, he stayed to the very end to show the power of Krishna to the world. And also he had a mission. His mission was to show that no matter how powerful you are, if you're against Krishna, you lose. I mean, Bhishma Dev could have, I mean, he was so powerful, he could have annihilated the whole Pandava army by himself. <laughs> he, had, he had the benediction that he could live as long as he wanted. Death could never touch him as long as he didn't want to die. And his fighting prowess was the best. He was better than Karna. He was better than Arjun. He was, uh, there was no comparison to Bhishma Dev. But he wanted to show the world, you know, that no matter how powerful you are, if you're against the Supreme Personality of Godhead, you are defeated. So it was a message. That was the underlining principle of why Bhishma Dev took up the fight against the Pandavas. The external reason was that he was being uh, being uh, supported by Duryodhana, but that wasn't the main reason. Thank you very that's much. Brought, yeah, that's brought out in the commentaries like that. Mm -hmm. That's Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Okay, should we should we end here? We want to take a little break, and then uh, for those who are really want to get an insight on meditations for the new year, we have Radha Swami coming up in about one hour and ten minutes. So I would suggest all devotees, please get ready for that. It should be interesting and very enlightening. So thank you very much. Happy New Year. Hare Krishna. Thank you so all much, Maharaj. All oh, glories to Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> my obeisances to all the devotees. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for giving a valuable association in time. So now we will offer obeisances to Maharaj. Vansham Kaltarubhishya Kripa Sindhu Evacha Patita Na Paamirko Vishnavindu Kuti Vishnavindu Ki Jai Shashimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai His Holiness Chandra Mauli Swami Maharaj Ki Jai Thank you very much, Maharaj Krishna Maharaj Hare Krishna Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Om Vatsranam.